I'm Alex Mosetta, and welcome to Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle between large tech monopolies and traditional incumbents. I'm excited that we're joined today by a special guest, Nikhil Pawa, the founder and CEO of Media Nama, joining us live from India to talk about uh, India's recent ban of 59 Chinese apps. Media Nama is a uh, publication in India focused on tech policy and regulation. Great to have you here, Nikhil. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me on, Alex. This is an interesting time to be in India, um, especially with everything that's happening in tech policy. Uh, things have been moving at a really fast clip for the last two and a half years in the tech policy space. So there's never a dull day. Yes, and and certainly the past couple of days have probably been uh, extremely uh, grueling for you. I know you've been on, a, you know, uh, opining a lot on on what's happened recently. So why don't you just give us the high level? What happened? What did India recently do? Uh, why are we talking today? A couple of days ago, at uh, at about uh, eight thirty at night India time, uh, it's about seven. It's about seven thirty right now in the evening. A couple of days ago at eight thirty at night, India issued a press release announcing that 59 Chinese apps are being banned um, in India. And uh, they didn't specifically mention Chinese apps, but they've said that they've issued an order under Section 69 of the IT Act that there were some apps which were found to be uh, concerning related to the sovereignty of India and that there are data protection and privacy issues with these apps. Now, all the apps listed in that are some of the most popular Chinese apps in the world. Um, so there is TikTok that's been banned. There is uh, Vigo Live. There is Cam Scanner, which a lot of people use for scanning documents. Um, there's an app called Share It, which people use to transfer when they buy a new phone to transfer it uh, in all the settings and all the apps to a new phone. So that they use uh, Share It. So there are 59 apps in that list, and each and every single one of them is Chinese. Um, the Chinese embassy hasn't taken very uh, like this very lightly. They issued a strongly worded statement saying that they have serious concerns about this violating uh, WTO norms, and they've issued state. Uh, they've said that you know this is against free market operations. You know the irony of that. Uh, so uh, uh, China is not very happy, and uh, India is also. There's, there's a bunch of support for India and Indian apps. Uh, there are clones of these Chinese apps that are already being talked about. There's a new app called Chingari, which was launched to counter TikTok. Um, so it's a, it's a fun situation uh, with just all the action uh, happening uh, right now. But what's not fun is what led to the situation. So uh, in April, there were was, um, uh, India found that there were Chinese troops that were uh, that had, were setting a camp around uh, what is called the line of actual control. So there's a India shares a border with China, and there's a there's a border dispute. So the operative line, which both country around which you know territory around which both countries claim, but and they have fought a war over, um, but neither country sets up camp in. Uh, the Chinese started uh, amassing sort of troops over there. So there were skirmishes between the two countries and uh, 20 Indian soldiers were, were killed. Now, the, the, the understanding is that no shots would be fired, so no guns were used. And, you know, we saw horrific images of uh, rods with nails on them being used to brutally uh, attack the Indian side. At least that's what emerged in the Indian media. These were like, you know, kind of like IEDs, improvised explosive devices. You said they weren't firing bullets, but these were... No, no explosives. So they were essentially almost like a baseball bat kind of a thing. There were rods into which nails had been uh, sort of hammered in, and they were used to physically assault the Indian side, is uh, what we've been told. So it was a physical, it was a physical attack. There were no shots, there were no IEDs, there were no... Bomb. This was an up close and personal attack. I mean, this wasn't just exactly some exactly. accident. This was uh, dev that's devastating. You don't you don't hear that in the news, by the way. In I have an article here from from the South China, you know, Post, right? 
And in the article, it says, The unprecedented move, which came weeks after 20 soldiers died in a border clash in the Himalayas. But the article doesn't say that it was 20 Indian soldiers that was killed, and it doesn't go into it. Um, but that's, yes, that's very important context here as to, you know, what just happened a couple of weeks ago. You also have to understand the terrain at which this is happening. These are some of the highest mountains in the world. This is the highest mountain base in Himalayas. Uh, and uh, I have been in that area and those mountains are almost vertical. Uh, I mean, so, you know, if, so this is a valley called the Galwan Valley and there have been troops, so there's been a buildup of troops in from what I understand, six different locations, including, um, you know, one of the most beautiful lakes in the world uh, at a very high altitude. Uh, so, and and uh, yesterday we heard that there were more troops that were amassing around another uh, border area that, that China claims. So there is movement from China into Indian territory or territory which both India and China claim. But as a ceasefire, there was neither of them were setting up camp in. Uh, a few years ago in another area called called Doklam. You know, what I remember from the uh, tech policy great point around Doklam was that there was a worry about UC News, an app in India at that time, a Chinese app which was run by UC Browser and UC Browser is owned by Alibaba. So at that point in time, UC Browser uh, which essentially kind of like the old Opera browser, which was compressed data before serving it to you. Um, that was one of the, that was the, the most popular browser in India. Uh, Safari is almost non-existent. Google Chrome was huge. Uh, Firefox is small. But at that time, UC browser was the largest browser in India, about 60% of the market, right? And they also had a corresponding news app called UC News, which is aggregating news. So there was a suspicion and in the grapevine that UC News was suppressing Indian articles that were that were anti-China, and it was allowing uh, highlighting of the Chinese point of view. That's the concern that was there in the Indian government. So the fact is that Chinese apps can be used for misinformation and disinformation campaigns, and to change people's perspectives on a particular situation depending on what news they surface. So this move by India to ban these apps is the way I feel it's largely political, it's largely preventive. It's kind of, they want to send a message to China. I don't think this is around data privacy, um, even though that is a concern. Um, and in fact, data privacy issues related to TikTok have been raised in the Indian parliament about a year ago. In July, uh, several members of parliament had raised issues saying that they're taking data from Indians and taking the data to China. Um, which is again, you know, that entire conversation around digital sovereignty with them. So we will get into it. You know, on that, on that note, I think this, if this was around, you know, data privacy, there, there could have been other actions that were taken in the past. But the other part of this is just reciprocity, right? And, and we've talked about this many times on the show on Winner Take All around, well, you know, China has a walled garden for for any tech company to access its market. Yeah. But there's no reciprocity elsewhere, right? Chinese apps can pretty much freely flow into other countries. And countries like the U.S. are slowly starting to look at this. India, I'd say, has probably been much more progressive. Like if we, if we think about um, the marketplace regulation that they put on foreign entities owning marketplaces. You can't have a marketplace as well as, you know, be a kind of traditional e-commerce seller in India, right? Like uh, the restrictions they put on Walmart, for example, or Amazon um, in India. So I feel like, I mean, to me, this was a very smart political move because it was a way for them to retaliate to China in a very strong way without you know, more physical harm and without actually doing it in a, um, you know, in a military fashion to escalate things, but to do it in a, you know, technology, right? Uh, do you, do you like this move uh, as opposed to say other ways to try to escalate things, but to kind of move it into the tech arena? So I think there is escalation, uh, there's an attempt at de-escalation on the physical side. Uh, but I believe there is escalation on the digital side. So there were news um, items that came out 
about five days ago and I'd, and quoting unnamed government sources and sometimes that's just the government trying to plant uh, a particular point of view before it takes action, saying that there have been um, cyber attacks on the Chinese side on Indian government uh, websites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, it could have been in retaliation to that alongside what else is going on, but it could also very well have been in a sense to uh, stir up nationalistic sentiments and try and stir up, you know, uh, cohesive sort of a, um, you know, uh, some kind of cohesion in the Indian population saying that, look, we're doing something against China when China is doing something to us. So, uh, look, at the same time, I mean, from if you look, look at China's actions over the last few months, um, the incursions into India, the some actions around uh, the South China Sea, uh, it's, it's also, it also seems to be the same thing that China is doing, that um, they seem to be escalating things around uh, or uh, escalating certain issues because that, again, will bring, get the population to support the CCP and the Chinese government uh, at a time when it's probably a bit weak uh, given uh, the pandemic. So this is more for a domestic constituency, and I think from an India perspective also, this move is also to feed a domestic sentiment and feed a domestic constituency. I don't necessarily see this as a strategic long-term kind of a move. If you work at, at, at TikTok in India, there's an article here that says they have 2,000 employees in India. Are you looking for another job right now? Well, no one knows, right? We don't know how long this is going to last. From a user perspective, the creators in India seem to be very unhappy because TikTok was a huge platform for them. One thing to remember, India accounts for 30% of TikTok's global users. Uh, not much in terms of revenue, but at least in terms of user base. Right? India has got some 625 million internet connections. Uh, we have uh, uh, the highest number of users for Facebook, WhatsApp, YouTube, TikTok, um, and a bunch of others. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, a, a, a large base that's coming online. Like we've got the cheapest data connections in the world. Um, for about seven dollars a month, you can get one GB per day. Is that Geo? That's not just Geo. So it's Geo and others because mm. Geo has dropped the competition down. And what's happened is that an average Indian user uh, uses about ten to eleven GB of data per month on a mobile internet connection. So we've seen users go up, costs go down. Every company is looking at India as a potentially uh, huge market because it's a democracy unlike China. So it's open to uh, other entities coming in. But what we've also seen is that uh, since 2015, uh, there has been a buildup of tech nationalism in a sense. There's a pushback against uh, other countries or companies from other countries not just the Chinese uh, entities in this in this instance, but also against Google, Facebook, um, uh, not Microsoft much, but yeah, uh, Amazon definitely. There were there were protests outside uh, the stadium when Jeff Bezos was in India in January and uh, giving uh, and basically announcing a huge investment in the Indian market. So uh, Indian traders have been worried. There are political organizations that have been campaigning against Amazon and TikTok, for example, for the last few years. Some of that is coming to fruition now. Um, the other thing that you'll find interesting, you know, just moving to sovereignty is that uh, from uh, what I understand at the open-ended working group in the UN, India has submitted its filing in which it said that, that a nation's sovereignty ought to extend to data, no matter where that data is stored in the world. Now that filing was pulled from the site in three days. So I don't know whether they asked for it to be kept confidential or not, but that's what we noticed. So that's, for me, that's very really interesting because, you know, you've seen India's largest industrialist, Mukesh Ambani, uh, who owns Reliance Geo, uh, and uh, even, even major politicians talk about data as being the new oil, data as being a national asset, uh, and most Indian policies are geared up towards increasing control over the internet. So I'm kind of afraid that we might be headed slowly in the China direction ourselves. Um, but I think India's decide, decision is that they'll not go that far. They'll be somewhere in the middle. They'll have their own definition, their own approach to the internet. Everyone's moving in the China direction. If the China direction is 
more control over data and internet. Everyone, every country is moving in that direction, unfortunately, U.S. included. Although I have liked India's approach to try to find somewhat of a happy medium. How do I still, you know, support a local homegrown tech community and put some guardrails on how these foreign tech monopolies, whether they're from the U.S. or China, put some guardrails so that I give some advantages to my local Indian uh, tech companies. I feel like they've done a pretty good job of trying to find that balance, especially compared to, you know, other countries uh, in, 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 the, in the global kind of tech economy. So um, like you were talking about here with Geo, Facebook put $5.7 billion in. Now they've got money from Silver Lake and Vista and KKR. Was that viewed negatively uh, with all these kind of US, both tech and, and private equity investors? Yeah, so I, the funny thing is that when Facebook put in uh, that kind of money and took about 10% stake in Geo, uh, it was people were in India were acting as if Facebook has bought Geo, but they didn't get a boat. They got a boat seat, but an observer boat seat, so they're not necessarily involved in decision making. Uh, and they've got a commerce partnership that they're going to use to compete against Amazon and Flipkart. So WhatsApp is huge in India, about 400 million. Uh, monthly active users, uh, and that that's a 2017 number, right? So it's a 2018 number, so it's huge. Uh, but WhatsApp hasn't been able to monetize. So for Facebook, um, what they're trying to do is they've enabled WhatsApp for business, where businesses can um, communicate with their customers, handle customer queries, send transaction messages. Now they're looking to enable omni uh, omnichannel commerce on WhatsApp. So effectively, WhatsApp is going in the WeChat direction here. Now, Geo uh, has not, and WhatsApp has struggled to launch payments because India mandated data localization. And so <coughs> this partnership with Geo means that Geo is setting up something called Geo Mart for aggregating omnichannel commerce. And those products, those stores will be available on WhatsApp. Both these companies have struggled in commerce and payments. And I think what we'll see is that, at least my view is that neither of them could have succeeded independently because you've got Amazon, you've got the, they split the market between them uh, in um, over there. And then on the payment side where WhatsApp is trying to operate, you've got PhonePay, which is owned by Walmart. You've got uh, Paytm, which is owned by Alibaba, or majority, a significant stake by, by Alibaba. Uh, you've got Google Pay. So there are a bunch of these guys who are competing in both commerce and payments. And Facebook and uh, Geo have both failed to make a mark over there. So they're better off together than competing because uh, they wouldn't be able to win this battle by themselves. Really insightful, Nikhil. Um, you know, it's getting late over there. I don't want to keep you any longer. would love to have you back on the show. Really loved the insights. Lots of interesting things going on in the Indian market, both with this Chinese app band, but also elsewhere. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, stay well, my friend, and, and I'll talk to you soon. You too, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Good fun. Nikhil has a lot of really good uh, insights and just uh, you know thoughts on what's going on about tech in India. Uh, one of the, I mean, Top countries, uh, just in terms of, you know, digital users. We've seen the Indian government be very progressive in many ways. We've seen um, Indian uh, tech companies growing quite successfully over the past few years. So it's really interesting what this move will do, um, both to help insulate that Indian tech community from these Chinese apps and and many tech monopolies that that have you know, either a full majority ownership stake or a partial ownership stake in a lot of these apps that uh, that were recently banned. It'll be interesting if this is a first wave and is there a second wave to come that could look at uh, other companies that, that pose a similar threat, uh, but might be more of a fringe use case, right? These are pretty clearly apps from China operating in India. So for example, uh, Zoom. We've spoken on many times on the show about the U.S. Navy needing to ban certain apps like TikTok, 
We've spoken um, about Zoom having all of its product and engineering team in China. Uh, we were just talking about how Zoom kicked off these uh, Chinese activists against the communist Ch- Chinese Communist Party and how Zoom came out and apologized for kicking them off the Zoom platform and said, you know, we messed up, we'll, we'll make amends. There are articles now floating in India talking about, hey, well, why didn't you ban Zoom? Because yes, it's an American company. It's headquartered in America, founded by an American citizen, Eric Yuan, but who was born in China and came over to the United States. And you have over 700 of their product and engineering staff in China. Very little product and engineering staff in the United States, mostly sales, marketing, customer support, and that kind of stuff. So we spoke about it. There's an article that kind of said it's a Chinese body with an American head, this Zoom app, for example. So could these things come under fire if there's a second wave or if, you know, as as Nikhil was saying, he thinks that this move was done primarily for political reasons. We spoke about the military clash that happened, which devastating to hear about that. Uh, and so the Indian government needed to respond. It seems like this has been received pretty positively, both in India and elsewhere, outside around the world, uh, that because of this thing called Corona, um, has harbored some resentment towards China. And the double standard, which is very clear here, a double standard where um, whether you're an American tech company, an Indian tech company, fill in the blank tech company that's not from China, you don't get access to the Chinese market. But the Chinese companies get access to all the other markets. I think this, what happened in India, is going to set off a chain of events to have foreign governments not China, reevaluate in whole the access that they allow Chinese tech companies to their markets. And maybe this starts to become a quid pro quo, uh, kind of everyone's favorite three words these days around saying, well, hey, Chinese tech companies, you don't get access to our market unless we get access to your market. Full stop. And then it'll be interesting to see where some of these companies like a Zoom and a TikTok fall. Kevin Mayer the uh, former executive from Disney, now CEO at TikTok. Boy, this guy is having a rough couple months here. Um, very curious why Kevin took this job, right? I mean, it was very clear he was looking for something else after he was passed on for the role of CEO of Disney, everything, right? CEO of all of Disney. And he took the role of CEO of TikTok, COO of ByteDance, the holding company of TikTok. Maybe one or two episodes on the show, we spoke about how our videos, which, you know, haven't gotten, I mean, they get like, say, five, ten thousand 10,000 views, one of the videos that was talking critically of Zoom and the Chinese government started to get attacked by what we believe is an army of a hundred, hundreds of thousands of Chinese kind of like social media influencers that will go and comment on your videos to try and change the perception of the Chinese government abroad. Because the irony is that, you know, a lot of these social media apps aren't even allowed to operate in China, including TikTok. Anyway, very curious. Kevin has a lot of stuff to clean up. And, you know, I think a Zoom and a a TikTok slash ByteDance, these companies that are on the fringe here where, you know, TikTok and Kevin are saying, hey, we are putting up Chinese walls to separate ourselves from ByteDance to not allow data to go into China. Zoom is saying something similar. I think they're going to have to really look at taking drastic measures to separate themselves uh, from China. If, if they don't want to fall, you know, on basically the wrong side of this. And I, and I don't think this is a single occurrence of what we just saw with the India ban on these 59 Chinese apps. I think this is a chain of events, series of things to come. It has been building both in the US and in Europe, clearly in India now with, with these 20 Indian soldiers being brutally uh, killed. So unfortunate. And this is a tough job. I mean, with with the level of like bot um, activity on TikTok, that's clearly a coordinated effort by the Chinese government to change the perception of the Chinese government abroad through TikTok and other social media platforms. He's got a lot of stuff to clean up, and that's not a fun job right now. And it's 
Um, I don't know if he really knew what he was getting himself into, right? I don't really know if he knew the extent that this uh, commingling and the extent of these issues are. And I don't know if he's too happy about the position that he's in right now. So uh, we'll see if, um, you know, we'll see what he does. But if it was me, TikTok could be a public company on its own right. I try to spin that company off, spin it out of ByteDance, move all the engineering out of China. I would try to move all the engineering of Zoom out of China also. You have the money to pay for this, right? That was kind of Eric at at Zoom's reason to have the engineering in China was that it's cost effective. Now it's doing way more damage than it is good. I can tell you that much. So these companies really need to look at not just setting up Chinese walls and protocols to separate. They need to look at wholesale departures, complete separation. Um, as we're seeing this, these three tectonic plates of separation from an economic separation, from a military separation, and from a technology separation uh, from the U.S. and China and now other governments like India and China. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Um, I think this was a very smart move on behalf of the Indian government, a way to escalate things, to have a strong response to their soldiers being you know, really murdered um, by the Chinese army and, but doing it in a way that didn't involve kinetic weapons, right? Didn't involve them going and and killing uh, Chinese troops. So um, I think a very smart, tactful move here on their part. Last thing is we have some Q and a today. So we've had a number of uh, really good comments past few days. So I want to kind of go through and let's start from the bottom going up. So we have from Sarah Princess here, what do you think about Kevin's choice to move to TikTok? Can he help TikTok become the next YouTube and have positive revenue without users to give up on the platform? Great question, Sarah. Kind of what we were just talking about. I think Kevin's maybe having, I mean, I guarantee Kevin's getting paid a boatload of money. We don't know his comp package. I guess, I think, you know, ByteDance goes public or TikTok goes public. Kevin's probably making like at least three, four hundred million dollars. I mean, that's a nice payday um, if all of this goes well, right? Which, as Nikhil was saying, India has, I think it might be one of, if not the most populous user base for TikTok, but isn't really driving revenue to TikTok. Um, so TikTok could have huge aspirations. It could be a tech monopoly, but it, I think more and more so we're seeing it needs to separate, truly separate itself from the Chinese part of ByteDance. Um, and that's going to be a very difficult thing to do. That's going to be a multi-year initiative to try and pull something like that off. From uh, Powell, huge fan of uh, YouTube. Thanks, Powell, and the book. Big thanks. Do you think Cisco is considered a platform company? So we came under fire for not considering Zoom a platform company. And you know the reason why, and the reason why Zoom is not in plat, by the way, the platform ETF, is because there's no network effect. There's no supply side network effect, right? You can you can host a Zoom meeting and then you can invite users to come to your Zoom meeting. Um, so you could say the host is a producer and the, you know, the people coming to the meeting is a consumer, which makes sense. But there's no, you know, if you really think about it, it's a pipe. And so it's a pipe more than a platform, right? There's no um, like common user identity. There's no idea of you have like a, a a friend network or an address book, kind of like a WhatsApp, right? These more communication platforms. If you look at the communication platforms, there's usually some idea of friending. There's like a double opt-in, right? So, you know, I would be using this video conferencing app to connect with all of my friends. So that idea of friends and that double opt-in and that stickiness on the demand and the supply side, it's really not there for a Zoom or really for any of, uh, you know, for any of these other solutions. So if you look at being able to compete with Zoom, you just need to have a slick video conferencing app, which there are now like 10 plus competitors. Google has Google Meet. Facebook has their own version. Microsoft has Microsoft Teams and Skype and, you know, there are, and, but even if you look at Skype, you have this idea of friends. So there's really no kind of like social networking, this friending model in Zoom. If they added that in and they showed that stickiness 
uh, boosting engagement and that kind of network effect, then I think Zoom could be considered a platform business because that's going to give you a barrier to entry because now it's not just about the technology and ease of use of using Zoom for video calls. Now it's about the technology and the network and your ecosystem of friends and connecting with others, right? Whereas right now it's really much more of a a push function versus kind of push and pull. Drew says here, he just finished Bottom Monopolies over the weekend. Awesome, Drew. And he had some questions on Fiverr. Um, the platform strength seems strong, but wanted to get your thoughts on it. Comps on the space are upwork, but it's a completely different model. So let's look at let's look at um, Fiverr. So Fiverr is actually um, a public company. It's it's headquartered in Tel Aviv, and I believe that Fiverr is about to be included in Plat uh, in the upcoming rebalance in a few weeks. So uh, Fiverr is a great platform company. It's a little bit different than uh, the the Upwork model. If you think about the interaction model on Fiverr, you know, Upwork is kind of like a reverse auction. I kind of post a job and then people bid on that job. Whereas, you know, Fiverr is a little bit different in the sense that, um, you know, people are offering their services. Fiverr, the rates are more transparent and the consumer can pick different services that are offered by these different producers that have different services based on the ratings and, and the reviews. So Fiverr has... You know, you can do, you can get digital um, services. So, you you know, you could get people to um, help you with different research tasks or, or creative tasks or art tasks, right? Different, different kind of digital services. It's an amalgamation of all these different service providers where Upwork is more focused on that kind of remote freelance work, right? Or you might have, um, you know, more uh, um, like a like a handy or or Angie's list, which is focused on that in person kind of like contractor services, right? So I uh, it'll be I th- I think I think it is going to be included um, in uh, in the next rebalance on Plat. We'll see how it does uh, for for the stock, but it is a pretty interesting company and has surprisingly been able to carve out a pretty nice pretty nice place for itself in the platform world. So. That's it for us today on Winner Take All. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful 4th of July. Um, If you're not in the United States, I hope you have a wonderful uh, week and weekend, and I'll talk to you next week.